Okay, time for take two. Alpha 3 is now out, and it fixes a big problem with Alpha 2. So, now seems like a good time to do a deep dive on the new multiplayer networking nodes. Here's what we're going to be looking at today. I like to do these project walkthroughs, so we're not going to build everything from scratch, but hopefully you'll learn everything you need to know. We'll quickly look at our authoritative server here. It's not really authoritative, but it is a server. You can run it locally, and I've got it running up in the cloud. If you want to know more about that, we can do another video in the future. But for now, I've included a couple of batch files in the GitHub project that launch it, but basically you just have to pass some special command line arguments. One that tells it to run as the server, and we can tell it to run headless. Before we dive into the code, I want to share a couple of quick disclaimers. First, Godot was made by a bunch of really smart people, and I'm not one of them. Secondly, this walkthrough is using an alpha build of Godot 4, which means those really smart people might still change how everything works. It's also alpha, that's a really important word. It means there's bugs and stuff is broken and you definitely should not be starting your dream project here. At the time of upload, all of this works in alpha 3, but it should continue to work for all of Godot 4. Finally, networking is really complex, and I can't teach you how to make the next Fortnite or Final Fantasy XIV. This video is meant to be a stepping stone towards letting your friends run around with you in your game. You know, small scale stuff. So, let's start looking at some code. It makes sense to me that we'd start with our startup scene. That's configured here. Later in the video, we will look at all these nodes, but it's basically a little map somewhere to stick all of our players and some UI stuff. Dead simple. So let's jump into that script. Now, our entrance point is enter tree. You might be used to seeing ready, and that definitely still exists. We use it in a bunch of other scripts, but the way that the scene tree works is that all the nodes are added from the top to the bottom, and then ready gets called on each of the nodes working from the bottom up to the top. That means that the ready method of our child nodes would happen before our network is configured. So we're using enter tree, which gets called when the nodes are added. When the game starts, we check for the server command line argument. If it's there, we call start networking, telling it that we want to be the server. Otherwise, we're going to be a client. Now, let's read this method backwards, and we'll look at what a client does first. We need a enet multiplayer pair, because we're using enet, and then you just tell it to create a client. Here I'm passing in networking explain dot which makes things up online, which is where my server is in the cloud, and we connect on port 4242. To connect on a server running on your machine, you can just change this URL to localhost. You could also use an internal IP address, but unless you set up port forwarding through your router, you won't be able to use your public IP, and port forwarding is a whole other topic. Anyway, that's all there is for clients. The game starts, we connect to the server, done. The server's a little more complicated. We connect to a couple of signals which will fire when someone connects or disconnects. Next, instead of create client, we create server. It only takes a port because by default it will bind on all of your interfaces. So if you have an IPv4 and an IPv6, it'll be listening on both. Now, we only connected the signals on the server, so these functions are never getting called on any clients which means that when someone fires up the game and connects, the game will load the map, connect to the server, and then just sit there doing nothing. Over on the server side, Godot fires the pair connected signal, which calls our create player function. First, we instantiate the player scene, then we name it after the pair ID. Now this is gonna be really important later, but we'll talk about authority when we get to the player script. For now, just know that everyone who connects gets a unique pair ID. It's like a phone number. We're naming the player node after that phone number, which means it's going to be unique for everyone. Finally, we add the new node into our players node over here. Now, because this is only running on the server, clients still don't know that this exists. Which finally brings us to our first new Godot 4 node, the multiplayer spawner. In our case, it's called player spawner because it spawns players. Like most nodes, this is configured in the inspector over here. The key bit is this replication array. As a security measure, the multiplayer spawner will only instantiate the scenes that you have configured. So if you want this to spawn a gun and a player and a health pickup, you're going to need to add them all into this array. 
In my case, I'm saying that the only thing it's allowed to spawn is the player scene. Next up is the spawn path. This is the parent node for anything that this multiplayer spawner is going to spawn. It also ties in with the auto spawn flag, so if the authority spawns a node under the spawn path, the multiplayer spawner will automatically spawn a copy of that node on all connected clients, and all clients who are going to connect in the future. That's the real power of this new Godot 4 node stuff. You don't need to worry about maintaining that state anymore. As we saw in the script, only the server calls add child on the player's node, but because we've ticked auto spawn, the multiplayer spawner is going to see that new node on the server and automatically spawn it on all of its clients. Finally, there's a spawn limit. I haven't set it because I don't have a specific limit in mind. So there we are, that's all that you need to spawn a player scene for each player when they connect to the server. But that's not much of a game if you just connect and that's all that happens, so let's go see what a player can do. Particles, collisions, UI, all of that's not really on topic, so I'll briefly come back to it at the end of the video, but for now, let's just skip on to the networking node. Now this is just a plain old node. The script just has a few variables. By convention, I'm using the sync prefix for anything that we want to send across the network. All the real magic happens in this child node here, the multiplayer synchronizer. It's a new Godot 4 node that synchronizes stuff for multiplayer. Weird, huh? It needs a root path, which is where it looks to find the variables that it's going to replicate. And it's got a replication interval, which is the time between updates. So if you have something that doesn't change often, you might just want to send updates on every half a second or something. But for things like player position, we want to send updates as fast as we can. With this set to zero, it defaults to 60 updates a second. Unlike the multiplayer spawner, synchronizers have a special window to control some of their settings. You can add any properties on the root path that you want to share. It's also got flags for spawn and sync. Hopefully that's self-explanatory. So, Roughly 60 times a second, this multiplayer synchronizer is going to send these three values out into the network. This is where we need to talk about authority. This is the concept of ownership of a node. By default, every node in the game is owned by the server, which is to say its authority is set to 1. Multiplayer synchronizers only send messages if it is the network authority, which means by default only the server can replicate data to all the clients. But we need to get information from the players to the server, so the player needs to have authority somewhere. Remember back in the startup script where we set the name of the player node to match the peer ID? That was that phone number thing? This is where that becomes important. We want to set the authority of each multiplayer synchronizer to the client ID that it represents. And we do that over in the player script. Here, in the ready function, we set the authority for the multiplayer synchronizer to match the player scene's node name. It's really important to know that this code is going to run on the server and all of the clients. So, a pair connects to the server, that triggers create player, which instantiates the player scene, then the multiplayer spawner copies that player scene to every client, and then ready gets to run everywhere, and ready here is going to set the multiplayer synchronizer authority so that it's in sync between our server and all of our clients. The multiplayer authority of a node doesn't automatically get synchronized. Okay, so we've got our authority under control. I really regret naming this node a player. It's a, it's a character. You, the player, connect and control a character. Anyway, we'll skim over most of the scope. There's actually only a little bit that's important for networking, the main one being this is local authority method. It checks whether the multiplayer synchronizer is owned by us. Remember that all of the code runs on every client and the server. So our script wants to figure out whether it's the player scene representing our client or if it's the player scene for someone halfway across the world. We do that by checking if the multiplayer synchronizer authority matches our unique peer ID. Remember, our peer ID is that phone number idea. We use that method a whole heap. Going back to ready, we use it to decide whether we should lock ourselves into this player's camera or whether we should see the player's UI to show the jetpack fuel. The next major chunk of code is physics process, 
And the first thing that we want to do in our physics processing is work out if this is the player scene that we're controlling. If it's not our player, then we should just set the position based on the networking values that have been fired at us from that multiplayer synchronizer. We're not interpolating between the current position and the newest received position, which does mean that characters are going to snap around a bit, especially on slower connections. We are smoothing it a little bit by synchronizing the motion velocity, then we use that to move and slide on those frames in between receiving new positions. But interpolation is a pretty complicated problem. If you're really curious, I've linked to a video from Game Development Center down in the description. Anyway, let's get back to it. So if we are the local authority, we need to act on the inputs of the real human being that's sitting at the keyboard. This is pretty much just the character body 2D template with a couple of tweaks, like having a jetpack instead of jumping. At the end of it, we call move and slide, just like you would in a single player game. And then we update our three networked variables so that our multiplayer synchronizer can send them off across the network to everybody else. And honestly, that's all there is to it. We have a multiplayer spawner in our startup scene that creates a player for each client that joins. And then each player has a multiplayer synchronizer that tells everyone else on the network what they're doing. Now, obviously, we are trusting clients with their own position here. Someone could easily hack the client and make it send a position that's outside of the map, and there's nothing the server could do about it. Remember the disclaimer from the beginning where I said networking was complicated? We've just taken the easy way here. It'll work perfectly fine for co-op games, but if you're trying to do something competitive, you'll probably want the server to be fully authoritative. Whew. All right, if you want to abandon the video now, I won't blame you. That's sort of the networking stuff covered. If you want to stick around for a few more minutes, we'll take a quick look at the rest of the project. Let's start with this uh, big UI here that everyone sees at the top of the screen. That just connects to a signal in my game state singleton. And whenever the quote unquote score of the game changes, it updates the UI. If we go have a look at the game state, it's just a simple little node that synchronizes the score every second. Now the way that that score is updated is by these little blue buttons. If we take a quick look, it's got a pressed and an unpressed state. When the server detects someone walking into a button, it'll press the button and update the score. Players can't mess with the score, aside from hacking the client to teleport them from button to button. I don't think that's a problem. The number just goes up. If we jump back to the player, we can look through some of these nodes. Uh, we've got CPU particles for the jetpack. We've also got a camera, which we'll zoom in and out. And then we've got this little progress texture. Diving into the code, if you're jumping, we update is jumping and then trigger our particles. We also adjust the zoom. So it zooms out as you fly, which just lets you see where you're going a wee bit better. And obviously if you're not jumping anymore, we set is jumping to false, turn off our particles and start zooming the camera back in. Finally, if we're standing on the floor, we reset our fuel. Now, is jumping gets synced across the network. So everyone else on the network sets their particles to emit or not whenever that changes. As I'm recording this, I'm realizing that the local authority could control its particles through here as well. Setting them in physics process is I think a leftover from when I had the server as the authority during development. If you check GitHub in the future and it's changed, that's probably why. There's also this note in here about GPU particles being buggy. Normally I'd use GPU particles, but you can't spawn them in local space last time I looked. Did I mention that Godot 4 is still an alpha? You gotta be prepared to deal with stuff like that. The last bit we can look at is how the fuel UI works. It's just a uh, texture progress node and each frame we update it to match our current fuel by setting its value. You just need to set it as a percentage and I've done my fuel range from zero to a hundred. It's almost intentional. Anyway, I think that's all that I wanted to show. If you're curious, there are a few more comments in the code explaining how I've done different pieces, and the entire project is up on GitHub, along with every other tutorial thing that I've done. I've also now jammed it all together in one repository, so you can just download the whole lot. And if you want to connect to my server and push my buttons, you can grab the GitHub release, or just check out the project and run it from the editor.
Finally, if you want to do the YouTube thing, you can like and subscribe. And if you tried to follow along, but everything broke, just let me know in the comments and maybe I can help.